further ado, let's begin. And biases influence various aspects of life, from identity to boardrooms, social circles, and beyond. As we rebuild the post-COVID world, these biases can influence judgment and even the hiring process, specifically when it comes to gender. And the challenges are many, and it is important that we look beyond gender biases and celebrate the unique contributions that each person can make to organizations. And we must break the barriers set by gender biases, engage in dialogue, and realize that differences are what make for inclusive and enriching workplaces, and ultimately a future marked by progress. And today's roundtable discussion will examine the techniques we can use to break gender bias along with entire career pathway and subsequently close the leadership gap. And the key discussion points we, that will be uh, discussed today is the identification of biases and the creation of frameworks to build biasless workplaces that bring together a multitude of skills and experiences to promote organizational growth, improve well-being, and enhance employee and client retention. So how can cultivating growth mindsets create opportunities that can tip the balance in favor of women and career success? And how do you close the leadership gap in the workplace by disrupting the status quo? And to address these points and more, it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, the Roundtable moderator, Ms. Nina Michaels Kim. And Nina is IMA's Director of Partnerships, Japan and Korea. And previously, she established the IMA Europe office and has founded the IMA uh, Switzerland chapter. She has spoken at and served as facilitator at numerous conferences and events across the world and is a regular author of uh, articles and blogs. And Nina is also an entrepreneur and co-founder at StarlingPartners.com com a zurich based consultancy and prior to starting her own business she worked for over 13 years as a finance professional in the pharmaceutical industry and has worked in japan the us and switzerland as she holds a bachelor's in international relations from uh, pomona college in california and a master's in foreign service from georgetown university in washington dc and it is now my pleasure to bring on Nina for the roundtable. And Nina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ryan. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, as you may know, um, this webinar is part of a global series. Um, it's part of IMA's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, D-E-N-I, and you know, not only does IMA publish important research, which you may have heard from our press releases, but we also create opportunities such as this to discuss, exchange ideas, and raise awareness on bias. And that is one of the main goals for today's session. Um, and mentioned before, this is part of a global women's leadership series of roundtables. It started out in India on May 9th, and last week it was held by our colleagues in the Middle East. And today, our roundtable featuring Asia Pacific speakers is the third of the series. And next week, the series will conclude with a roundtable from our colleagues in Europe on May 31st. Um, today's session features an amazing group of women, and I'm so honored to be the moderator. Um, and they are all high performers in finance and accounting, all certified management accountants, US CMAs, and they are transforming, breaking the bias on a daily basis. So before we start the round table, I would like to briefly introduce our panelists, um, starting in alphabetical order by last name, which coincidentally is also the uh, alphabetical order of the country that they receive, uh, reside in. So um, joining us from Sydney, Australia, is Mrs. Jane Sarah Lott. She is a results-oriented and commercially astute financial professional with over 12 years in financial management and analysis with her extensive background working in finance for blue chip multinational organizations such as Verizon, TTC, Chevron, 
and Ernst and Young. She brings diverse perspectives and a strong understanding of best practice financial management. In addition to her US CMA, she also received her graduate diploma of chartered accounting from the Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand. Passionate about continuous learning, she became a Microsoft Certified Data Analyst Associate and TIBCO Certified Professional on Spotfire. Jane holds a Bachelor of Science in Accountancy degree from the University Santo Tomas from the Philippines, graduating magna cum laude. Hi, Jane. Welcome to the program. Hello, Nina. Very excited to be here. Great. So our next panelist, Ms. Ai Ono, is joining us from Tokyo, Japan. She has almost 10 years of experience working in financial planning and analysis, FPNA. Currently, she is an associate director of the FPNA team of CBRE Kabushiki Kaisha the Japanese arm of CBRE Group, the world's largest commercial real estate services and investment company. In CBRE Kabushiki Kaisha, she has covered a variety of roles, including accounting and financial reporting. Her most recent achievement is the implementation of cloud-based corporate performance management software. A newly minted US CMA since March of this year. Congratulations again. She also holds a bachelor's degree in accounting from the Fox School of Business at Temple University. Hi, Ono san, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Nina san. It's great to be here today. Okay, last but not least is our third panelist, Ms. Dai Yujin based in Singapore. She serves as senior finance analyst within the Treasury Department and Johnson & Johnson, J&J. &J. Since assuming her position in 2019, Eugene has been a strategic business partner for the affiliates in Asia Pacific regarding Treasury related matters and leads the budgeting and financial closing of the Treasury Department. As a strong believer in diversity and inclusion at the workplace, she is a board member of an analyst forum that we'll hear more about later, and she is dedicated to protect the interest of all analysts from any form of bias. Eugene passed both CMA exams in one city in 2018, earning our gold medal for the highest exam score in that testing period. She holds a Bachelor of Business Account Administration and Accountancy with distinction from the National University of Singapore and has completed J&J's Finance Leadership Development Program. In 2020, uh, she was part of a group of volunteers to establish the IMA Singapore chapter. Hi, Eugene. Welcome to the program. Hi, Nina. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, I'm so honored to be with you guys all. Let's get started. Um, so, one thing I wanted to talk about is um, just about what the current status in each of the countries that you currently reside in. So, for example, um, as you may have known, IMA and Cal CPA published a report last year on the U.S. accounting profession, the current status, and they have found that at, uh, less than 14% of Fortune 500 CFOs are women. So, you know, despite the focus on DEI topics that we always hear about, the current status is still kind of dismal. Um, so, maybe to start off, I would first like each of the panelists to state how the situation is in whatever country you currently work and live in. Um, maybe per, give the percentage of the share of women occupying top C level positions. Um, and, and the, you know, explain the current gen situation of gender gap and DNI situation in your country. So let's start with Jane. Yes. So, uh, Nina, um, this was a very interesting question that I did some research and what I found was quite, um, extraordinary. So, based on the annual census by the chief executive women.org, the statistics in Australia for CFOs in the ASI 200. Women comprise only of about 9% back in 2017, and then it jumped slightly higher to 12% in 2018. So that's about 18 women CFOs out of 200 in 2017 and then 24 in 2018. If we look more broadly in Australia, based on the 2019 to 2020 uh, Workplace Gender Equality Agency report, about 18.3% are women CEOs, while for the ASX 300, it's only 6%. So that 6% translates to 
18, which is one eight out of 300. And from what we can see here, uh, women continue to be underrepresented in senior leadership positions. Okay, it, it's uh, quite amazing to me because you would have kind of just traditionally thought that um, in Australia, because it's so near to New Zealand, where, where there's a New Zealand prime minister who is a woman, um, you you would have thought that the results would be slightly better. Um, but uh, let's let's hear now from Ono-san on the statistics of Japan, which I, I personally know that it's also probably closely up, uh, approaching the Australian um, statistics. Ono-san, could you give uh, what what you think is the current status in Japan? Okay, uh, well, let's talk about the current situation in Japan. Uh, maybe as you know, more than U.S. or other countries. Few women occupying CFO or senior position in Japan, unfortunately. According to Gender Gap Index, I, uh, Japan has ranked 120th among 156 countries in the Gender Gap ranking in 2021, and it was the worst among G7 countries. In addition, according to the latest survey of Takeoff Data Bank, which is one of the private survey company, women currently occupy only 8.9% of management position in Japan. But um, this was the highest ratio since this survey began in 2013. On the other hand, another survey said only 48.6% women were interested in receiving future promotion. Well, um, I like to say, well, regardless of gender, talented person should be promoted and show leadership. But um, even my case, Although I have worked at U.S. affiliated company around 10, 10 years, my CFO was always men. However, uh, this is my personal view. Definitely the working environment for women is getting better and better, but it's still not easy to find female leaders. Around two decades ago, the Japanese government has set a goal of having at least 30% of women leadership position by the end of 2020 but still there is a huge gap between ideals and reality. Currently, the, the government not set a goal of 2020, you know, it has already passed. So now it, it has replaced it with the phrase as soon as possible. This is the current situation in Japan. Thank you. Yeah, I did hear about um, the upcoming uh, new government laws to try to improve that situation in Japan, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, thank you, uh, Ono-san. So, maybe moving on to Eugene about the Singapore situation. I'm also curious where it lies between Australia, Japan, and Singapore. Uh, yes, so I, I am very proud to be the last one to share, but Singapore is generally very good in terms of its track records. So generally, 33%, uh, which is one third of the management, senior management position uh, in Singapore is occupied by women. So uh, I think based on the 2022 business time, so it's very recent, um, Singapore CEOs, 13% uh, of them are uh, women, whereas um, for the CFO position, 33% um, of CFOs in Singapore are women, so it's one third. So, uh, and maybe just some sharing from my personal observation. So I work for Johnson & Johnson, it's also a US company. Um, the region, the Asia Pacific regional office is based in Singapore. So, uh, the out of the three regional CFOs, um, who are overlooking the entire Asia Pacific business, but they are sitting in Singapore, two out of three of them are actually women. And um, since I joined Johnson and Johnson up until today, all my managers are women. Yeah, and uh, maybe just to move. Uh, a focus into treasury um, in the Asia Pacific treasury team, the entire management are all women. So, uh, yeah, but generally uh, from uh, my observation for Singapore, uh, multinational companies, uh, those um, companies who are of a larger scale, have more balanced the male to women 
um, employee ratio as well as a management ratio, whereas um, those smaller companies and um, um, startup firms or family business tend to be run by men. Okay, that's very interesting. So there seems to be a discrepancy in uh, Singapore between family-run businesses and large MNOs uh, or the multinational uh, organizations. But that is so positive to hear how uh, the gender is quite equal in uh, Singapore and that two out of three of your CFOs in your department are women. So um, that is very positive. Uh, but on the other hand, the discrepancies of Australia and Japan still is uh, pretty dismal. And um, I yes, don't know, amongst uh, the... Th yes, would you sorry, like to say so something? Sorry to no, disturb please. you, Nina. Uh, maybe uh, I give me around one minute. My computer is telling me that it's running out of battery. So I will go and grab a charger. Okay, yeah, no problem. Anyways, I'll, I'll first discuss about the dismal things about uh, Australia and Japan. So it was the perfect timing that Eugene had to drop off for technical issues. So let's start um, with uh, Ono-san about uh, why do you think in Japan um, it is so bad with the yeah. diversity? You sta stated the current status, but um, it would be great to hear your insights of what you believe are the barriers for women in Japan? Well, sure. Um, maybe as you're aware, there are several reasons, but the biggest one is definitely traditional gender roles. In the past, you know, many women are forced to choose between marriage or career. Now, situation has been changed, so many women return to the office after giving birth. But again, you know, compared to other countries. Japanese society is still conservative in some ways, with men expected to support the family and women expected to take care of the home. Because of this background, while well, sometimes women are discriminated against in the recruitment process, and even the, if they are hired, they are not given the same opportunities as male employees in terms of promotion, because women are sometimes blocked from the longer term career paths due to the assumption that they will quit the job after getting married and having children. Second is entry-level position recruitment process is different from other countries. But actually this idea is also coming from traditional gender roles. Well, it doesn't apply to every company, of course, but especially local Japanese companies still apply this recruiting practice. So that idea is women, when they enter the company, they have to decide whether to pursue the career track or the non-career path. And I think it's very hard for a young woman to decide from the beginning. Once they choose non-career path, they generally handle only assistant types of jobs and their chance of promotion are limited. And another factor is in case of Japanese formal business, especially men dominated industry like real estate, relationship building often takes place offline over drinks after work. But um, due to COVID-19 environment, it has been reduced, but still drinking with coworkers and bosses is considered important relationship building too. Yeah, I it's uh, I also cover Korea and that is also very important Korea, the um, informal gatherings after work, but it is very difficult to do if you are um, responsible for um, children to take care of uh, getting dinner on the table, but it should not only be women, it should be affecting also males yeah. and, and taking turns is something that my husband and I try to do, although I mean, yes, uh, hopefully. There's uh, really bad things about COVID, but one good thing is possibly that, you know, the, the tight knit family and then decreasing of that so that the people start thinking that that shouldn't happen every night of uh, <laughs> informal <laughs> gatherings. I'm hoping that uh, is sort of the trend too. Um, so it seems like Eugene is back. <laughs> <laughs> Just in okay. time. 
Okay, so um, maybe uh, so it was interesting to hear from Ono-san about the how the traditional gender bias still plays a lot in um, Japan, uh, and that also the relationship building that takes place is all very interesting. is a is a barrier. Um, and maybe you can explain, Eugene, why is it better in, in Singapore? Like, what is the main difference? What do, does that even take place? Like how traditional gender bias, um, is that not even there? Like, is it not expected that women be the sole, um, childcare person in a family? Maybe you could elaborate on that. Yeah, okay. So when I first see this question, or, or rather when I first see the this discrepancy between like the amount of senior leaders in Japan versus the percentage of senior leaders who are women in um, Singapore, uh, I am also very surprised like why is Singapore the percentage slightly better? So uh, I, I, I try to do some research and the first point that I discover, I am not sure whether Japan really has such a difference from Singapore, but the first point I discover is that uh, women in Singapore are generally very well educated. In fact, sometimes the number of university graduates um, is the percentage is higher for women than men. So I I think in 2017, 53% of the university graduates in that year are female, whereas uh, yeah, for 47% are men. Uh, so same thing is um, for the age group of 25 years old to 34 years old, so the, the younger generation, 90.2% uh, of women and 90% of men have received um, secondary or tertiary, or uh, uh, has received post-secondary or tertiary um, qualification in Singapore. So as you can tell here, education levels are very balanced between men and women in Singapore. In fact, women sometimes receive um, even more education than men. So uh, because women are educated, um, most of us uh, tend to have the mindset that um, we will want, we, we, we will have something to pursue. We, we want to have a career, we, we have our goals, we have our dream. And therefore, it, it, makes, it, um, it, it makes it harder for us to um, give up on, uh, on our career for the family. So um, when, so, so sorry, let me just close the, close the I am. Yeah, so, so, so when, um, when it comes to the workplace, you observe that um, women, um, even though we have family commitments or um, uh, we face some discrimination, but uh, because of the amount of education we receive, uh, most of the time we actually tend to um, brave on at, at the workplace. And then on top of that, actually, uh, in fact, it's the tone and the talk from Singapore government that is actually eliminating the discrimination and bias against women. So the amount of maternity and family support given to working mothers um, is very sufficient by the Singapore government. You have uh, 16 weeks of paid maternity leave. You have um, up to six days of paid childcare leave. Yeah, so, um, and at the same time, government actually uh, kind of encourage, but I would say um, enforce um, employ uh, companies uh, that are based in Singapore to uh, apply certain um, family friendly uh, policies. For example, a flexible work arrangement. It's been there even since before COVID. Uh, support schemes for working mothers, and some companies even have extended childcare leaves, as well as the government uh, up to. Uh, they, they target by the end of 2025, they are targeting to have more than 200,000 um, uh, full day childcare centers to, to house all the, all the kids so that women can work. And the third factor that uh, is a factor that I observe from Singapore society, generally, we recognize that family is not just the responsibility of women, it is also the responsibility of men. So there's a lot of campaigns encouraging um, active fatherhood. Um, you also see that, for example, um, after work gatherings, it's not just over drinks, um, 
uh, just a few men gathering and over drinks, but it can also be a few women gathering and over drinks. So, so you, you might question if women, they have after a gathering, they go out for dinner, go out for drinks, what about their kids? So that for that night, it will be the husband taking care of the kid, not, not, not just the wife. So I think generally because of this society mindset, it makes it easier for women to um, continue or pursue um, career progression in organizations. Yeah, I think you hit the nail right on the head. It really is about the society mindset, you know, and eliminating the bias that only women should take care of children because, um, you know, you gave the examples of um, these uh, generous uh, child care in Singapore, but actually, you know, in Japan, it is one of the most generous, uh, according to law, <laughs> of, of uh, giving child care leave. So, you know, uh, it's 12 months for uh, working parents. It's uh, even male employees uh, will be entitled to four weeks. Um, and starting in October this year, and uh, but the problem is, you know, according to uh, my research, uh, you know, less than 13% of fathers actually take paternity leave, even though they are entitled to at least two works currently, and then it would be four weeks in October. And now the Japanese government is starting also a campaign, a campaign. and even I saw a video, Eugene, about your company, J&J &J in Japan, is, has a big video out there about of, of one male employee who decided to take paternity leave and how much it was good for him and et cetera. So there's just this campaign that's starting right now. I mean, I hope it will improve, but, um, you know, compared to the 13% of fathers in Japan that took the paternity leave uh, in 2020, uh, it was 82% of women who had to take maternity leave. So you can see that it's not equal um, at all. Um, but I, and I think that some of that must be biased. So, well, it, it really is these um, biases that impact um, especially in Japan and, you know, maybe Ono-san, you could share some other negative experiences that you personally have experienced or others that you witnessed. Um, uh, maybe kind of, if you're comfortable with sharing um, a negative example of gender bias that you experienced, Ono-san? Sure, yeah, I have some, but, you know, since time is limited today, I would like to share with you two experiences. Well, both were happened almost uh, 15 years ago when I returned to Japan after graduating from college in the US. So I hope things are better now. One was when I was interviewing for a job, several companies asked me if I wanted to work after marriage. <laughs> well, it was a pretty common question in Japan at the time. Well, I just answered, yes, of course. Well, I assume not only myself, but also most women candidates answered yes for these types of questions because we want to get offered, right? <laughs> so I was not sure why they always ask these questions. But I was aware they didn't ask the same question to men. I think it's better that they just ask me, like, please tell me your future career plan or something like that. And another story is, after joining the company, I attend the seminar on business manners. It was a small class, only five people joined, and out of five, I was only woman. During the lecture, the instructor only asked me to practice serving a tea when someone visited the office. Then I asked her, excuse me, why I only have to practice this? She told me, oh, because you are a woman, it's better for you to practice it now. Wow, that wow. was a, a woman manager doing yeah, that to yeah, you? Yeah, woman instructor. <laughs> that a uh, woman instructor. But see that that is also yeah. I hope that has changed. You know, this mm -hmm. is the reason for this too. I mean, listening to the um, Indian and and Middle East uh, discussions too. It really does need to be women managers that help other and lift up other women. But please continue. <laughs> okay. Well, at the time I was young, I was shy. For some reasons, couldn't complain. I couldn't say anything in front to that person. But I felt, you know, that treatment was unfair in that situation. And after returning to the office, 
I shared this experience with my manager and my boss, and he said, well, I understand your thought, but still there is a stereotype that assistant job is for women. So I don't have specific answer how to overcome these experiences, but uh, I, at least I could learn unconscious bias exists everywhere. You know, both interviewer and seminar instructor words were not intentionally, but um, it was coming from their stereotype. So it's necessary to be aware of your own biases. You know, otherwise bias can lead people to treat others unfairly. Yeah, no, it's uh, really sad to hear about that. <laughs> and, you know, I've experienced uh, myself uh, those kind of things, and I really appreciate you sharing that, Uno-san, um, you know, but I feel like it was a long time ago when the, I experienced those kind of things, and I hope that it's improved, but it's I'm listening that it's still not really improved yet, this uh, bias is um, that people think that only women should be serving tea or taking um, notes or acting as a secretary or bringing the coffee. Um, so that's very depressing. And maybe I would like to try to see if we have some positive experience on um, bias that possibly maybe uh, Jane, maybe you can start off and give us a positive experience um, that occurred in your career that helped you um, where you felt like you were supported. Definitely, uh, Nina. Um, although I, I do feel sad whenever I hear uh, stories about disparities and, and inequalities. Um, as for me, I, I really feel very fortunate in my career. Um, so, for example, um, when I was in the Philippines, I've always wanted to relocate to Australia. And, and this happened about maybe five and a half years ago. And what happened was um, that opportunity opened up for me when my permanent resident visa um, got approved for Australia. And then I was working for a company called T-Tech, which is an American multinational company on customer experience technology. And what happened was um, I was having this conversation with a senior executive who was based in the US. And then um, I told him about my plans of moving to Australia. And then after that, he made a personal introduction um, to someone um, within the business who was handling the Australian um, operations. And then from that personal introduction, that led to job interviews for a role based in Sydney with people in Australia. And then that led to a job offer and then eventually landing my first role here in Sydney, making my move, um, which was uh, really crazy, but also exciting at the same time, feel very supported. So, so what, did, what did I learn from that experience? I, I realized that it's very important to find and have sponsors and champions who are prepared to go out on a limb for you and open doors for your career. Yeah, that word sponsors and champions came out also in the other round tables. And, you know, that is something that is also uh, mentioned in the reports. Um, in addition to mentors, women also need to have sponsors and champions, like you said. And, you know, I've said this before, but uh, back in my days, you know, when uh, I was st first starting out, I didn't even know about the term sponsors and how important it was to get sponsors. So I'm so good that, uh, you know, I'm so glad that we're now using this language and, and helping um, younger women who are just starting out in their career to look for sponsors in addition to mentors because that is so important and i'm um, really glad that you shared that uh, jane um, what about eugene uh, maybe you can um, talk about how a positive experience that you had that maybe would help other um, other women on the um, on this round table participating yeah so i i guess I am the lucky one. I mean, I after right after I graduate, I joined um, Johnson and Johnson. Uh, I kind of took um, gender equality and um, bias-free working environment as I kind of took it for granted. Yeah. So so to 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 me, it's like uh, uh cause my workplace um on a norm normally so far I have not seen any like really um gender inequality or bias behavior occurring but maybe let me share one experience not by me but by a colleague who um uh, this is a very positive experience 
who got supported to come back to work after staying at home for a few years. So Johnson & Johnson is actually very supportive of uh, mothers who are returning back to the workplace. So uh, my, my colleague, I, uh, I met her after she joined Johnson & Johnson. She was explaining how um, she spent a few years at home and she found it very challenging to find a job uh, after, afterwards. And Johnson & Johnson hired her and gave her the opportunity, eased her back into the working environment, um, gave her the enough support so that she excelled at her work. And not to mention that within these few years that I that I personally know her, she actually applied to my senior management team asking for a one year sabbatical leave so that she can take her son for the um, primary six um, uh, school leaving examination so it's one of a very big examination in Singapore so she she was she uh, so so she 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 tried to apply for sabbatical leave she thought she would be rejected but actually she was encouraged so she was told that um, your son's um, exam is more important uh, please take this year off we will retain the position for you after after your son um, finish his exam you can still come wow. back to this position and work yeah, so I guess I kind of took uh, this kind of gender bi bias-free um, environment for granted. So to, to me, this is normal. So when I hear of all the gender bias, um, the the treatments, actually, I, I, I sometimes I get very angry about it. Yeah, I know, especially because of the when women are uh, well-educated like yourselves, um, well-established, working really hard it, it is despairing to hear about this but i mean thank god that you know your story and then jane's story too proves that you know there are people who support women um, and it's so important to have uh, these sponsors or even the whole culture at uh, a company that supports women and and men who want to take time off too, you know, it could, it could have been the, the uh, father who wanted to say, I want to support uh, the son to complete this. And that should be taking more and more, right? That, that more uh, males and fathers should take time off to do that kind of stuff. Then it would equal out a lot of the gender gap in my opinion. Um, but uh, very interesting to hear from both of you, for all of you, for um, the three of you on the different um, experiences with bias that you have seen or witnessed or experienced. Um, so maybe let's move to a little bit more positive and, and maybe some, um, some learnings or some um, things that you would like to inform the audience about because the, all three of you are successful women overcome if you have experienced gender bias um, or have been supported um, by sponsors um, and you're standing here as established uh, women in finance and accounting. Um, maybe could you have some recommendations that you would like to share to the audience or um, or even you can even use the platform to say what other things are necessary for women to rise um, to the top. Um, maybe we could uh, start with J Jane. Yes, uh, Nina, uh, I actually feel very honored to be in, to be invited to speak as a panelist today. And so, um, in terms of my career, um, I do have the top three things that I have learned um, that I can share with the audience. Uh, so the first one would be um, something related to what I've said earlier would be having sponsors. Um, in our career who could support us um, to move forward as we become more successful. And the second idea, which is closely related to the first one, would be to be willing to do the hard work necessary to meet that opportunity. Um, so since the senior executive, um, he has known me for about three years supporting his portfolio for Asia Pacific, and he knows the work that I do. And that was why he was confident in making that recommendation um, to that person, because whenever someone recommends you for something, um, that person is putting his credibility on the line. So um, we don't we don't want to have um, um, that kind of um, like challenge. And then the third one would be having a support group of successful women around us um, who are in a similar journey, because as they say, uh, we are the average of the five people we surround ourselves with. So I those really are the like those. 
Yeah, thank you so much. I, I really like those points and, you know, some of them have also um, came up in um, the Middle East. Uh, round table, which I attended, and so you see that it uh, doesn't matter wherever you're located, no matter where you're located geographically, some of these uh, points are still relevant for everyone around the world. Um, so the importance of sponsors willing to do the hard work and that is actually um, what one of the panelists in the Middle East said is, you know, it depends on you, your uh, personality, you, um, your traits, your attitude. That is also very important. Um, and then this support group network of women that also came up and I, I really um, do um, uh, really, you know, uh, cherish that or I would like to support that. And IMA uh, is this by these women leaders. Um, Ship series and um, which we do um, these roundtables are the first time these virtual roundtables, but we do have um, women leadership uh, series live meetings. Um, they've occurred in New York and Europe, and I, I believe through this network we should keep this going. I hope we can do this, and um, especially if you do not have such a support group in your companies, unlike Eugene, seems like. Um, uh, Ono-san was saying real estate is a male dominated thing. Maybe you don't have people to share. I hope you can always come to us. Um, and another webinar that I uh, attended, it was very interesting. It was uh, in Japan and the general manager was, uh, it was Baxter, one of our corporate clients in, um, in IMA. And the general manager said this term, uh, woo, woo mentors, right? Women, he combined women and mentors. And I asked him, can I use that? He said, yes, you can go ahead. But really it's like this, um, there has been a question and we can address it later. Uh, keep the uh, questions going, um, audience. Um, just write, type it into the Q&A and I'll answer them later. But uh, one thing I wanted to say is that, you know, women uh, supporting women and then the, to be women. <laughs> I, I love that term and I think uh, uh, it's really good points, Jane. Um, Maybe we should move to Ono-san. Could you have any recommendations that, that you would like to state or um, some improvements to the system? Well, for my recommendation, uh, while sharing your future career plan with your boss as well as CFO is really important, if, especially if you want to become a manager or leadership position in accounting or finance field. Well, if you know, if your boss knows your thought, a chance will come around for you. And important thing is more easily to get the support from your boss. In my current company, all employees have, me submit, have to submit career development plan every year, which is asking about the midterm and long-term career plan. Well, actually has a little pleasure because not only my boss or CFO, but CEO review it. And another issue is sometimes I forgot what I answered in the previous year, although they always ask us the same questions. But I'm sure um, I always answer yes for the specific, specific question. That question is, do you want to be in a manager position? And after submission of my career plan, my previous CFO gave me some advice on career advancement. So actually study for the CMA exam was one of his recommendations too. Of course, it's, it was not only a reason that I promoted. At the day, suddenly my previous manager left from the company and it was not easy to find a suitable person immediately. And also company wanted to reduce the gender gap of leadership position recently. So anyway, fortunately I could promote because of many factors. So from my recommendation is sharing your future career path with your boss and having the support from your organ organization is really important key. I agree. No, I think that's a very good recommendation. And, you know, again, referring back to the other uh, roundtables in this series, um, don't be shy about your career plans. That's very, um, some people said, like, you know, uh, nature of women is not to be not to toot our horn too much, right? Compared to uh, right. the traditional male, um, and uh, 
So they were talking about, for example, a woman will say it takes a lot of hard work and determination and accomplishment and and uh, education before a woman would be very confident and say, yes, I can take that job. And then a male can say that much sooner in their career development and before they uh, obtained all the success that we think we need to have before we're able to be confident enough to say that, that I would like to be the CFO in the future, right? So that is something that was also um, remarked in the Middle East um, roundtable. And Ono-san, you put it really um, also succinctly that put it in your career plan, put it in um, writing, make it known. Um, that is a very good uh, input. And, uh, you know, coincidentally, I had also when I was in uh, my um, career in Merck or MSD, my supervisor also said, you know, get the CMA established for your career path in the um, in the future. Uh, and also the, um, you know, I have to be like really saying it right from the beginning that this is what I want to do. So that's very good input. Um, and maybe Eugene, would you um, like to say something about this too or? Or should we just uh... yeah yeah sure definitely yeah so so um uh, so so basically uh as as a woman but because um I am still single so no family commitments yet so um uh I would like to share like what I observed from my colleagues who you know have elderly to take care of have kids to take care of and they have a huge group of family that they have commitments on uh, how how i observe that they are um, managing between work and their family so uh, one concrete action that i see them taking is um, actually just to be strong so sometimes your work commitments together with your family commitments can come in at the same time and everything can seem very overwhelming but um what it takes is to really stay calm uh, and you know tackle the things one at a time so that you get everything resolved and because there are moments that i can see that they feel like um giving up but they brave on and their persistence and them where they are in the career right now. Yeah, I think that's a good point. That's what people said too. And it, it was very interesting, like uh, that when you're employee, maybe you might think, oh, I'm not sure if I could do it now. Uh, also, with all the commitments I have, you mentioned too, elder care is also very important. It's not just child care. And, um, but when your support says, yes, you can, you can do it, that would be so um, very, uh, very helpful to have, right? So I think that is wonderful to have that kind of uh, support. And um, it's a good input from you, Eugene. I know we've uh, talked a lot about the J&Js, um, how uh, supportive J&J &J is. I wonder if maybe we could just, we we'll come back to that again later, but maybe Jane could say something a little bit about what um, other um, things that your current or previous employers are doing to um, nurture bias-free um, workplaces and corporate cultures, um, any good strategies from, from the employer side, because that's what we should also be doing as part of this panel discussion to have okay. and create bias-free uh, um, spaces. Please go ahead, uh, Jane. Yes, definitely, uh, Nina. So, um, you know, based on my research, um, what I've found is that when when companies and when companies have policies and strategies to attract and retain um, a diverse workforce, what happens is it has a very good impact on the bottom line profitability, and that is based on the 2020 report by McKinsey um, about diversity wins. And what I've found is that companies in the top quartile of gender diversity and executive teams were more likely to experience above average profitability than in the spear companies in the fourth quartile. So that was something that I found very interesting. Mm, with regards to the company I'm currently working for now, which is Verizon, um, I'm just really excited because um, there's a lot of um, traction and understanding with regards to the importance of DEI and how it demonstrates its commitment is through various strategies so that it could attract um, top talent 
Um, the, the top, there are quite a lot, but the top three that stood out for me would be first, uh, the employee resource groups. And these are groups which provide a forum for both professional and personal development. Um, two, the, two of those that stood out for me was WAVE, which is a women's association of Verizon employees and PACT, which would be for parents and caregivers together. The second one, because I, I like listening to podcasts, would be Lifting Up. And this would be about uh, stories um, from Verizon women leaders um, sharing their stories and the wisdom um, that they've gotten to get to where they are. And the third would be um, Commitment to Pay Equity. Um, this one stood out for me because um, according to the um, Workplace Gender Equity agency report, um, there's a, an, on average a 13.8% gender salary gap. And then when you go up into management, manage, the, the management gender salary pay gap is about 23.3%. So the, the top three employee resource groups, the podcast of, of lifting up and commitment to the pay equity. Very nice, very nice to hear about all those initiatives that are ongoing, Jane. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I don't know if we have a little bit more time for Eugene to uh, maybe add from uh, other policies or other concrete examples to create a safe and open space that uh, we're not that have not been covered yet. Do you, would you like to share some from your side, um, Eugene? Yeah, so uh, I think J and J is a company that thinks about diversity and inclusion. So it's not about it's not just about um gender bias, but it's about bias in all different aspects. So ba basically, um, because of this strong tone at the top, we 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 can comfortably say that like for example, promotion opportunities is fair for everyone, no matter who you are or what you are. Yeah, and then uh, we have like something like annual diversity and inclusion week, whereby uh, different self-help groups, for example, the LGBT self-help groups or the um, women self-help groups or the mother self-help groups, they will they will organize talks and panel discussions, something like what we are doing now, but we invite some um, CFO, female CFO to share their career experience to everyone else. Um, so to, 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 to all the rest of the employees to tell us how, um, if we want to be like them, this is what we need to do. Yeah. So, and also J and J give a lot of, um, flexible working arrangement to, um, working mothers. So working from home did not just start from COVID. It was, uh, it was already there way before COVID. Uh, if you have family commitments, just communicate with your manager and, uh, you can always, um, arrange your work flexibly so that you have you can take care of your family so uh, uh and also um actually johnson and johnson pay you uh, get, subsidize your delivery fee so if you want to be a mother if you give birth you get money yeah so 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 uh yeah so basically it's a lot of actions in place to uh let us feel that women is supported in the workplace there is no biasness um even the even the every employee should be treated equally these kind of words are actually pasted everywhere in the in the company in the office yeah so so i i, I guess it's this kind of um, environment that make all of us feel safe I like that. Yeah. So it's tone at the top and then even following through, right? That's yeah. very important. Um, I, and creating the safe space. I, I love that. I love to hear that there are people who are, you know, really have experiencing a safe environment to be themselves um, and uh, really embracing diverse uh, cultures and um trying to in, even improve on that. That's wonderful to hear. Um, and I think we still have before we have to go to the Q&A. I've seen some good questions. Thank you so much for um, continue to send that to us um, audience. Um, if uh, you want us to cover something that you haven't heard yet. Um, so maybe we'll start um, have two more questions before we go to the Q and A um, on our panel, our roundtable, um, and maybe I'll start with uh, Jane. Um, maybe you could be willing to share some of what you yourself are contributing to 
diversity, equity, and uh, initiative initiatives um, in your company. I'm sorry, diverse D E and I, which the I stands for inclusivity. <laughs> so diverse equity and inclusivity initiatives um, and how you're raising awareness at your own company or training within your team or company, Jane. Uh, yes, Nina. Um, interestingly, this is uh, this question is actually um, like a call out for me because um, I've been working remotely most of the time and I haven't been as active as I wanted to be uh, internally, although um, externally I, I've been much more active. Um, at that. So at the moment, I am part of um, a group of executive women um, here in Australia um, under Amanda Bleasing's um, She Sweet Club, which values um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and women empowerment. Because um, I do believe that when women support each other, uh, we all win. Oh, that's so cool to hear. Yeah, I, I want to do more about uh, that myself. Um, it is, it's actually like a little bit these questions and this round table is like, oh yeah, I need to make sure that I'm doing more of this. And especially with COVID, it is harder to uh, participate. Um, but th that is a uh, very interesting, the She Sweet Club. Yeah, with, uh, yeah, I, it's a very interesting initiative, um, Jane. And Eugene, we mentioned this before, but could you a um, little bit elaborate on the diversity and um, in inclusivity group that you're part of? Yeah, so uh, I am currently part of the Analyst Forum. So um, it is actually a self-help group for all analysts within um, uh, for all treasury analysts within Johnson and Johnson, approximately a hundred of us. So. Uh, yeah, just, just this hundred of us. So uh, this group does not specifically target a gender inclusivity, but it broadly targets the uh, idea of um, diversity and inclusion of all employees. These self-help groups, we organize activities to bond all the analysts together to help the analysts to network as well as um, we are there to help um, all the treasury analysts whenever they have questions or concerns or issues. If they find that it's challenging to go directly to the manager, they can speak to um, the six of us um, globally. So uh, six, the six of us on the board, uh, we are actually based in four different regions so that um, the employees in each region can approach the specific one of us directly for help if they need to. Yeah, so some of the activities we do, for example, like a domino game whereby we randomly group people up into groups and they are supposed to um, randomly um, speak to uh, one of uh, their colleagues in the group. And uh, after that, the, the colleague will speak to uh, the next colleague in the group. And you. so this is the kind of like blind networking that we do for them so that um, uh, so so that so as to bond the treasury analyst community, yeah. So uh, as well as we organize town halls, um, two times annually to and there are breakout rooms whereby we we either conduct survey or we conduct like interviews of all the analysts to check with them if they have any questions or concerns. And because it's breakout rooms, the group size is very small. They are tend to more um more comfortable to speak up. Well, I really like that initiative um, to protect women and the analysts, all is all analysts to make sure that they're free from bias. And in a small um, environment, you will feel more comfortable to speak about. I, and it's sort of a neutral body, which is also very good. Um, that's wonderful to hear of. Um, and, you know, we're. As I mentioned before, we're kind of coming to the end of this panel discussion. And before we go um, to the Q&A session to um, answer the questions from the audience, could we maybe go one by one and summarize um, like the take home points or recommendations that you would like to mention on how, what else we as a society or as company or as IMA or um, that or all women, <laughs> what we can do to um, create a bias less environment. Um, and maybe we'll go with Ono-san. Could you uh, maybe start to discuss your final take home point recommendation? Um, again, uh, un unfortunately, unconscious bias exists everywhere. 
but it's our responsibility to make sure we don't unconsciously act on them. Recognizing the importance of diversity is a first step to build an equal, diverse, and inclusive workplace. I think attending diversity events like today or take some training of awareness is one of the steps to build a biasless environment. Well, today I share the current situation of Japan, Japanese society or share my negative experiences, but I'd like to note that the working environment for women is definitely getting better. To become more biasless environment, mindset change for both men and women is really important key, I think. As I introduced, still many people in Japan, including women, believe taking care of home is women's job. Unless this mentality changes, the environment for working women will remain full of obstacles. Of course, company or government supports are necessary, but more than that, each of them try to improve the situation proactively and aware that diversity is really important. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Ono-san. The mindset change, we it was also mentioned by Eugene, but um, I hope it, uh, in Japan and Korea and other places that it would really approach more like the Singapore example where we have shared that it's equal responsibility, not just women to take care of the elderly and children. Um, and maybe now, uh, Jane, if you can share um, your final take home points before we move to Q&A. Um, so I understand that, you know, we are all biased and we cannot see our biases because um, they, they help us make fast decisions and that can perpetuate. So I believe that the first step is self-awareness, uh, being self-aware and conscious of what those biases are. And then second would be the importance of the processes and strategies within the company that promote the values of inclusivity and that mitigate those biases. Thank you, thank you, Jane, very well said. Um, and Eugene, let's conclude with you and then move to answer the audience questions. Do you have any take home points from your side? Yes, so to, to conclude, actually, I would say for everyone here um, to mitigate gender bias or any form of bias at workplace, maybe um, start with yourself. Recognize, uh, I think my point is a bit similar to Arno-san. So uh, recognize that um, we we might subconsciously make some biased um, comments or thoughts to certain group of people. Um, uh, tell yourself, don't do this. So so just 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 make a conscious effort not to be biased for yourself first before before we we hope that the rest of the society uh, not to be biased. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much for this discussion. I've really enjoyed myself, but let's now try to see if we could answer uh, the interesting questions that we've been receiving from the audience. Um, and um, one of this is something we've mentioned before. Uh, thank you so much for, for a question that we received from Syed. I've seen women acting differently from men and avoiding certain careers and certain activities and work or other environments and plainly saying we are all we are women and so they're making a barrier themselves so how can we demolish um, destroy these barriers if women themselves act this way so we've sort of mentioned this um, had some recommendations about this but would someone uh one of the panelists would like to take this uh question women acting differently to other women actually personally i think that for those who who say that uh, i'm a woman so this is not suitable for me actually the person just mean that this is not suitable for me uh so because if you are a woman and you this is your goal or this is your dream you you will you will just go and pursue it but if you use your gender as an excuse for not pursuing something then maybe it's just because you 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 don't want it that much or you you are not confident you can do it so for for those women having this kind of mindset maybe i would say uh be more confident 
but um be more confident believe in yourself that you can do it but uh, for 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 the rest of us who hear this kind of um self self induced biasness maybe let's let, let's believe that this is just a minority agreed i i, I like that um overcome self induced biases um and uh, another thing I wanted to say is that there is a very conscious reason, reason why IMA has um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So the E that stands for equity doesn't stand for equality. It's about equity because treating everybody as equal is actually not really fair when the basis is not the same. So um, there, you know, I want to counterbalance that and say that you. you for some women, perhaps like you had to take a break because of nursing and breastfeeding, which has to be done by, by women. Um, that that you cannot just treat everybody a week. You have to take a, be equitable about that. So it is um, there is still a, a reason why women need to bond together for some reasons, right? So it's very interesting is to be equitable and. Uh, hopefully bond together with that with each other and not um tr you know be inequitable to all women so i hope we were able to sort of answer that it's a very difficult thing because you don't want to self induce any um bias yourself you have to be aggressive and um take all of the career opportunities that are offered to you but also stand up for your right right like i i really stood up when i was there and i'm i really appreciate that that was an msd they gave me an office where i could you know i could go to the details but breast pump and all this kind of stuff but you that was very very um positive for me and that's why i was able to continue in my career and was even able promoted even in that state so i i think it is something that um you it's it's a balance right you have to stand up but also um not self-induce the bias so okay i hope i was able to answer that the next question i received or and thank you eugene for for being brave and uh contributing for your uh um answer too so the next question is from kizel um what do you think is the greatest edge of a woman in a competitive corporate workplace, especially for women who are just starting out, like as an entry level employees? Okay, this is very interesting. What is, um, and we um, were also discussing that um, during our rehearsal and stuff. What do you think is the greatest edge of a woman in a competitive corporate working place? So, um maybe um would somebody um care to talk about this one of the panelists what's um especially entry level employees i think we've lost eugene uh um, yes i realize yeah but video. no no i think there's some a little bit technical thing but would anybody would like to um it might be so kind of what we just concluded but the greatest um edge of a woman I, you know we said it before and maybe if i would just get the conversation started it was about the high education right we also said that um the eugene mentioned how in singapore um the many women are um educated very um at a high level even higher than women so um and it, and it is actually shown um that uh possibly that women are um i see it actually with my teenagers too <laughs> a little bit but you know like the more women do make the entrance exams and are studious um so that could be one of the first entry level um to uh, that uh that we need to have or, or that we um, at the entry level to be considered on a resume um, that you have these high competences. Any other um, input from the panelists? What is the greatest uh, edge of a woman in a competitive corporate workplace? Um, I do have something to share, uh, Nina. And I do agree about education, getting yourself educated and um, getting the necessary skills that is um, um, that is needed by the the marketplace at the moment. Um, another 
two other things that I feel that are important would be first is clarity, uh, really understanding what do you want from your career or and from your life in general. And the second is curiosity, because having a curious mindset of what's what's really available because you don't really know things that you don't know and you are able to learn more of that if you are curious and then you speak with a lot of people and from that um, you can change tra tra career trajectories and then be able to pivot to to interesting areas that you didn't know were possible so those three things education clarity in what you want and then third is curiosity thank you jane um for jumping in too. I, I hope that we were able to answer that question and I see that Ryan's on uh, already here. Do we have one more, uh, some minute to, to answer one more question, Ryan? Oh, let's go ahead. Okay. So um, one other question that I received is, um, you know, the what gets measured gets improved. So um, would you comment on whether your company or workplace is measuring its progress so either kpis um, or capturing statistics on d e and i initiatives um, would somebody like to maybe first uh eugene would you like to answer this yeah so actually d e and i is in our performance review and no performance review um how it's inside is during our annual performance review, um, we actually have to provide a list of names to our manager to gather stakeholder feedback. So my manager will basically send out um, requests to uh, my those people who worked with me before, and the questions will include like is reaching um inclusive during the meetings did she consider views from all perspective did she make a conscious effort to um ensure that uh that to ensure that there is no bias occurring during the meetings or when she's working with you she did not perform she did not treat you in any ways that is biased or made you uncomfortable so this is part of the feedback that i get from my stakeholders and it will be included in my year end performance review Okay, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so sorry, it's good my to... camera froze again. No, no, but but your audio, audio was fine, at least on my end. So I really appreciate that you said that. Yeah, so I believe that this area is something that we as finance professionals, we as management accountants, uh, we as CMAs can contribute the most, right? Um, and this is a day-to-day thing that we can do to um, help uh, improve uh, DNI, DENI uh, in our companies and in society. Um, I guess I have to go. I wanted to <laughs> also ask about, is there any last minute um, things that the panelists would like to say before we hand over to Ryan? So for the closing. Like to uh, share something. Um, I really yeah. think um, the culture of inclusivity is uh, will serve as a, as a foundation for everything else. So having that tone at the top and then support to build that kind of foundation is really important for a business. Definitely, I. Uh, uh, thank you so much to all panelists. Thank you, Jane uh, and Onosan and Eugene. Um, and I guess I'll hand over to Ryan. And thank you, Nina, for the very engaging and inspiring session. And once again, special thanks to our panelists, Ono-san, Yuting, and Jane, for the interesting sharing of your insights and experiences. And once again, thank you for, to everyone for attending this roundtable session. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed today's uh, discussion. And please connect with IMA on our many social media platforms and uh, click on the like button and follow us so that you can get all the latest updates in our region, including more webinars, more sessions like this, uh, news articles, events, and much more. And on behalf of IMA, the Institute of Management Accountants, uh, we wish you a very nice day ahead and we will see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, 
we we'll continue the dialogue. Uh, join the Europe session too. I think it was so interesting to go um, join. They they will even if the time difference doesn't work. Uh, there'll definitely be a video put up later or something. So I think it would be very interesting to uh, share a different geography perspective. So thank you so much again to all of our panelists, and thank you for the Southeast Asia team and Ryan. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.